One of my viewers that goes by the name of Agent Explore requested that I tell a fire story with more detail. Well, sure, I got plenty of fire stories, and I could probably draw you a floor plan of every serious fire I've ever been to. They're very dramatic for the people that participate in them, and I tend not to put many of them up because I don't know if they make that much of an entertaining story. But Agent Explore, here you go. At about three o'clock in the morning, the alarm went off. I was in my office up there on the second floor, most likely sleeping, it was a long time ago, don't remember my state when the alarm actually came in. But New York City is said to be the city that never sleeps. Actually, it takes a nap between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. So when we get an alarm at 3 a.m., especially an alarm that was received by phone and had details on it, we anticipate that we're going to something serious. We responded quickly, slid the poles, donned our, our protective gear, and went out the door, heading up 14th Street. At about this point on 14th Street between avenues A and B, I gotta remember it was past 3 a.m., so the streets were not crowded as they are now with people. Uh, it was devoid of people and cars. Uh, and we were wailing. We were moving very fast, probably around 50 or 60 miles an hour, which is pretty fast for, for, for a, uh, a heavy truck like that. <clears throat> but we knew we were going to something serious. And I could still, what sticks in my mind from this time long ago is approaching this, this traffic light up here that was red against us. And the chauffeur just leaning on the air horn. Uh, we were going to blow through this in intersection at a pretty rapid pace if there was somebody coming in from the right-hand side. Well, we wanted to let them know we were coming. And I remember feeling bad that this uh, apartment complex here, Stuyvesant Town, we were waking a lot of people up. But, like I said, we knew we were going to something serious here. These kinds of buildings, these tenement buildings, are, are made of, uh, of masonry and, uh, and brick and wood. And when they, when they get a good fire going, you can smell the wood burning. It's a very distinct odor. It's kind of a telltale sign. Hey, boys, roll your boots up. You're going to, see, you're going to a fire. That roll your boots up comment is a throwback to a day where we used to wear boots that you would uh, fold down. Um, if you were going to a fire, you would roll them up so the, uh, the protective rubber would come up over your thighs. Uh, they were gone. We were wearing bunker gear, which is like a great big giant snowsuit made out of a special material that was developed by NASA. It's kind of fire resistant. It's all uh, quite insulated. And that's what we were doing at this point. At least that's what I was doing. I was checking my gear, making sure I was buttoned up and covered up. We were gonna be going into, uh, we were gonna be going into the devil's chamber. I wanted to make sure I was as protected as, as I could be. When we came into the avenue from 14th Street back there, there was a man standing right at this this point here, frantically pointing to this building. Now, it was a little unusual to see somebody pointing frantically because there was fire coming out of those two windows. Those two windows belonged to a living room that was fully involved with fire. So my first thought was, yeah, that's penetrating insight into the obvious. But then I thought, wait a minute, it, it's it, you know, clear, he, why would he be pointing at something so obvious? And I looked up there, and in that window, on the fourth floor, there was a man trapped. He was standing at the closed window, looking out at us. Casey, my chauffeur, stopped right here in front of the building, and I took off right into that doorway. Now, the doorway was propped open, which was good. The ladder company wasn't in yet, so I didn't have to worry about forcing the door open. The ladder company was about two blocks away, down that away, racing in. I could hear them coming in with the same kind of uh, intensity that we had, uh, that, that we had uh, responded with. I gave the signal on the department radio for a fire, 1075, fire in a four-story tenement on the second floor, out two windows, a man trapped on the, on the top floor. Then I picked up what we call our walkie, our handy talkies. They're uh, 
uh, radios that we use for interpersonal communication between individuals and companies, and I radioed Ladder 11. Ladder 11? He responded, I said, you have a man trapped on the top floor. My job was not to take care of him, it was to put the fire out. Ladder 11 would uh, take care of that, and indeed they did. Casey took this hydrant, my chauffeur took this hydrant and started hooking up. I went up to the second floor and on the landing I saw why the guy was trapped, why he couldn't get out of the building. If you notice, there's no fire escapes on the front of the building and what that generally indicates is that there are, there's only one apartment on the whole length of the building. Like uh, this building here, well this is a big multiple dwelling and it's a more complex layout, but you can see there are fire escapes on the front, meaning there are multiple apartments and different fire escapes on the back as well. This one tells me, okay, one apartment, uh, well, two apartments on each floor that run from front to back. The hallway was right in the center between the two apartments. I got up to the uh, landing on the top floor and I could see why the guy on the fourth floor was trapped and couldn't get out because the door to the apartment was open while the fire was in the front of the apartment blowing furiously out this, out this way and venting, which is actually good for us, uh, for us firefighters. It was also coming out the door and going up, the, sending, you know, intense heat up the stairway, heat and smoke up the stairway. And until we opened up the roof, I'm sure the top floor was like an oven. You know, this guy couldn't get out. He was trapped. He was in grave danger. But again, my job was to put the fire out. My boys stretched some hose line off the back of the truck, brought it up to the second floor, and they were flaking it out. And I was trying to get the door to the apartment shut. I couldn't get close enough to it because it was too damn hot. And my nozzle man, uh, Jack uh, took a six foot hook from uh, one of the ladder company guys who were now on the landing as well just waiting for us to push the fire back into the apartment so they can get up and take care of this guy because they couldn't go up the stairs either one of them tried and it was like as he got two steps up the stairway it was like somebody hit him over the top of the head with a club you know and that was the heat once he went above the level of the heat it just you know knocked him back down again they couldn't get up the stairs until we took uh, took care of uh, took care of the fire so we took one you know uh, jack took his hook and tried to get the door closed using the extra six foot of the six foot hook but he didn't get good couldn't get close enough to the door even with that extra six foot of reach. Tells you how hot it was. You couldn't get it you know, within six feet of the open door to get it shut. It took Casey a minute or two to get the rig hooked up, the pumper hooked up, maybe more than a minute or two. It seems like forever when you're up on the floor. Now, we have the option of asking the pump operator to provide us with water. The, the, the rigs, the pumpers hold 500 gallons of water, so you could ask for quick water. The problem with that is, is that if they provide quick water and I start putting the fire back, I knew the moment that I pushed that fire back into the apartment, that the ladder company guys would be racing up that stair. And if the 500 gallons of water ran out, prior to Casey getting a good supply of water, that fire would push back out in the hallway and cook those guys. So it was my call whether or not to ask for quick water, instant water, or to just wait until Casey hooked up. And because of those conditions, I decided to wait, which isn't easy to do. But I just waited until Casey was hooked up and made sure the fire hydrant was operating properly and the pump was getting a supply of water. It was then that I asked them to start water. In a five-man engine company, like Engine Company 5, you had an officer, that would be me, and five firefighters. The MPO, the motor pump operator, Casey, who was out in the street taking care of the pump operation, and four guys on the line. One would be Jack, the nozzle man. He was right up front with me. There was a backup man not too far behind him to relieve pressure off the line. And the other two guys were making sure that the hose was flaked out properly and wasn't kinked, that we can get a good supply of water. And so as soon as we had water, you know, we bled the line. That's, you don't want to open the nozzle right away because the water pushing through the hose line will send a uh, stream of air out first with a very loud whoosh that, you know, guys working at a fire, when they hear that noise, they know water's coming quickly. It's kind of a signal to us, but you have to bleed the line first so you don't pump a whole lot of air into an already raging fire, giving it more air to, to burn with. So you have to bleed that first. We bled the line and then we got a good heavy stream of water and started moving in. Jack and I were crouched down kind of in a duck walk, walking on our knees and in a duck walk. 
And as soon as we got the line open, you aim the screen upward toward the ceiling and you move it in a circle. That pushes everything away from you. The water hits the ceiling. The water that doesn't turn to steam falls down, puts any fire out underneath the ceiling. That's the tactic that we use. So we started moving in. As soon as we got to the door sill and pushed the fire back into the apartment, I looked to my left and I saw Ladder 11 racing up the stairs just as I knew they would. It was their job to take care of the guy on the top floor and they were, they were out to get him. You know, saving lives and property. Lives come first. So we started moving in and we pushed the fire back and got maybe an inch or two into the apartment. It was the kitchen that the doorway was going into. And there was fire on both sides. So I had Jack quick hit, hit to the left. It turns out that the kitchen had a bedroom toward the back, but the door was shut, so the bedroom was not involved in fire. So he knocked the fire down to the left. And now we could focus on the fire to the right, which would have been the fire that was coming out the front of the building here. As soon as we move the hose line back toward the right side, again, you gotta remember, it's going across the ceiling. The ceiling collapsed. It was a uh, sheetrock ceiling, one of those quarter inch, half inch sheetrock ceilings. And it came down like a pancake, boom. If we had been another foot or two in, it would have hit us. We were far enough back that it did not, that this piece of sheetrock, big piece of sheetrock that came down like a pancake, when it hit the floor, nothing obstructed it. And whoop, it came down with a bang and the pressure knocked Jack in his ass. Good for Jack, he didn't shut the line down. He has control of the nozzle, but he kept it open. He knew how, everybody on the line knew how important it was for us to hold this fire in the apartment. The lives of our, our colleagues uh, in Ladder 11 depended upon it. There was like no failure here. It was like a, you know, no excuses kind of affair. We had to hold, we had to keep this fire inside the apartment and not let it get back out in the hallway. I grabbed Jack by the shoulder and I lifted him up. I got behind him, I yelled at Mike, the backup guy, get up here, move up close and lean into him. And then we moved the hose to the right and started moving toward the front of the building. And remember, this is the stairway. If we went this way, a right turn would have made us move in this direction. Now, after the, we knocked the fire down in the kitchen, there was a narrow, like, hallway, a pantry, actually, that connected the kitchen with the living room, which is the space behind me that you could see on the second floor. And we had to push through that. That was on fire as well. We get into the living room, and we're starting to knock this fire down. Now, what I just described to you in a few short minutes it felt like an eternity to the guys on the line, to everybody involved in these kinds of fires. The intensity with which you work, and we've got to remember, you're wearing, uh, you know, a ton of equipment. You look like a Michelin man, only in black, and, you know, your face is covered with a breathing apparatus and has a big conical face piece, and that starts getting fogged up, reducing your already poor visibility occluded by the smoke. So... Yeah, we started pushing into the living room and knocking that fire down. And Jack starts yelling at me to lower the pressure. He has a difficulty handling the line. And that would be my call to, you know, radio Casey down here at the pump and tell him to lower pressure down. I wasn't going to do that. Again, I'm holding this fire. There is no backing down here. We're not going to let this fire back out in the hallway. I don't want to start giving instructions to my pump operator to start screwing with the settings because if something goes haywire there and we lose water we lose men so no jack i didn't answer him i just yelled at mike again the backup man get up here and then i grabbed jack by the shoulder again and we just started pushing forward now what you don't see on the building that existed way back then in the 90s is there used to be like faux shutters around the windows these plastic decorative things that look like open shutters and You'll know why I told you that in a minute. Once we got through the pantry and started knocking the fire down, I could barely see through the fogged up face piece and the smoke, but I could tell that off in the corner was another room full of fire. At this point, I did something that I really didn't like doing. We're a proud competitive bunch of firemen. It was five engines job to put this fire out, but I knew that my colleagues up on the top floor furiously working to save somebody's life needed this fire under control. Jack was beginning to falter. He was complaining about, you know, he, he kept falling back. I kept picking him up. I could barely see. I radioed the chief, Pete Rice, uh, the battalion chief had arrived now. I knew he was on the scene. And 
So I radioed, you know, the battalion. Engine 5 is going to need backup. I later talked to Chief Rice, who was a really good fire chief, had a long history of, uh, of busy companies. He was standing about where I'm standing now. It was his job to supervise the entire fire. And what he knew that I didn't know is what I thought was another room of fires was actually those faux shutters on the outside of the building had caught fire. And he knew that that's what was going on because my host stream was coming out that window and landing on engine 5's rig. Pete just smiled and didn't even respond to my request. He did have... He did, however, have an engine in reserve at this point, which would later come up to relieve us. We had been working pretty hard. What Ladder 11 had done is they stopped right here. They put a ladder up to the, the, the fourth floor window, and John Hodgins, a firefighter with Ladder 11, went up there. The guy who was at the front window at that point had probably decided he need, you know, when I ran in the building, and I guess and he, he, he saw us go in and didn't get an immediate relief to his dire predicament. I guess he decided to try to make it for the back of the building where there would be a fire escape. And apparently what happened is he got a few steps into that very smoky apartment, became overcome by smoke and collapsed on the floor. John Hodgins got up there into the window and wrestled this guy to the window. Now, John Hodgins was a big boy. He was a big athletic guy, he looked like a football player. He might've been a football player for I know. We do have a football team on FDNY. And he got this man who was a big boy himself. He was over six foot, a 200 pounder easily. And he got his lifeless body up onto the windowsill. By the time I came out into the street, as I said, Battalion Chief uh, Rice had eventually sent up a relief engine for us to do the uh, mop up. You know, the fire was pretty much out now. It was just overhaul and getting out small pockets of fire that, uh, uh, that, that would be behind walls and that type of thing. Uh, so we'd leave that to the relief and uh, we had done our job and we had done a good job despite the predicament When I came out into the street This ladder about halfway down the ladder was John Hodgins three other firemen, you know precariously Positioning themselves trying not to fall off the ladder slowly getting this big guy down the ladder to the pedestal when I got to the, about this point right here in the street the pedestal which is about of the of the ladder which is about six foot high it sits on the back of the, uh, the back of the truck uh, they had gotten the victim down to that point and there was myself uh two ems people the four guys who had wrestled them down and we all got him down and onto a uh, and got him down on, onto a gurney the ems people took him away and i later found out the next morning that was okay he had been suffering from smoke inhalation, but it was treatable, and they did treat it. And the next day, while still in the hospital, he was alive and well. So that's the fire story. And it's one of the ones that stick in my mind of the hundreds of serious fires that I went to over a 20-year period of time, only because there were no shortage of, of problems that came up. There were lives in jeopardy, and it all went well because of teamwork. John Hodgins later received a uh, commendation at Metal Day. Uh, it's a special day for firefighters in New York City. Those who uh, do kind of special things. I mean, we work as teams, as you can derive from this little bit of a story. But we do acknowledge individual acts of heroism and bravery, especially when they save somebody's life, as John Hodgins indeed did. Now. The officer of Ladder 11 that night was Jay Jonas. And Jay is himself a legend in the fire department. Jay later as a captain with Ladder 5 was in the World Trade Center when it collapsed. And he and his company, a couple of cops and a few other people he had under his command, made it out safely. They were one of the few people from within that disaster that survived the collapse. And he became a national hero. Uh, and went on to be a deputy chief here in the department. And Jay, at the time of this fire, was the lieutenant, and he was in charge of writing up the uh, commendation message, uh, the commendation essay for uh, John Hodgins' medal, and he mentioned Engine 5. In the beginning, in one of the early paragraphs of that um, medal essay, he said, Engine 5 notified us of a man trapped on the fourth floor. He didn't have to do that. 
and it was kind of an attaboy to Engine 5. And I still appreciate that to this day, Jay Jonas, if you're still around and see this. I think Jay might even still be in the fire department. He's a senior chief, if he is. Uh, one of the top people in the department. He's really one of our best men. He may have retired by now. He's no youngster, not at this point. <laughs> but he is younger than me, so I guess it's possible he's still in the department. I don't know. Anybody who knows Jay Jonas, come and get in touch with me. It'll be nice to talk with him. So, yeah, thanks for watching, and that's my fire story. <laughs>